Hi everyone, uh, this is Nehal and I, um, I have Vikas with me also. Uh, first of all, I'd like, I'd like to, uh, to begin with uh, thanking Oz here. He's doing a great job with organizing these events. And this is one of the best community events in Bay Area. I've been part of this for, for almost two years now. Uh, and there's been great talks. I've been inspired and uh, and especially around this time where like, you know, there's there's a lot of external like, you know, events and things going on, uh, like, you know, keeping us engaged and like, you know, uh, having this platform for everybody to learn. It's it's an awesome effort. And kudos, kudos to the organizing team. Uh, with that, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, Right. So we're going to talk about confidential computing today. I uh, uh, basically what uh, I mean. I'm, I'm going to come to the agenda pretty soon. I I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, Vikas Bhatia is uh, is head of confidential computing at Microsoft uh, Azure. And uh, uh, the way we divided this talk uh, is uh, you know we we're going to talk about like you know use cases, uh, uh, introductions, use cases. And there will be a developer section uh, we're going to come to and do some demos. And of course, there are resources and Q&A at, at the end. Uh, so, so with that, I'm going to like you know uh, hand it over to to Vikas, uh, who's going to do like you know the uh, the, the overview of confidential computing and the interesting use cases they are seeing at Azure and in market, uh, along with an ecosystem that is that is building to to. Uh, support this whole uh, confidential computing uh, bandwagon that, that started like you know uh, last year so before we get started uh, i'd like to plus one um, nehal's comments on uh, to the organizing team and us thank you for giving us this opportunity uh, to come and speak to you all uh, really this is a difficult time for uh, <laughs> the whole world uh, so uh, please everyone stay safe and uh, Stay safe out there. <laughs> this is clearly a unique time in our in our history. So Nihal, I'm going to have to ask you to be my slide monkey on this, if you don't mind. Yeah. No, no, no worries. Yeah. So why don't we get started? So uh, as Nihal mentioned in the agenda, we're going to give you a quick introduction to confidential computing, and I'm going to touch on a few use cases that I have been seeing uh, here in Azure uh, and even across the industry. And then Nihal is going to do the uh, second half of this uh, uh, slide deck. Next slide, please. So uh, as we kind of get started, right, I, this slide is not new uh, information, especially to this group, uh, but it's still uh, um, something that we should talk about, right? Data breaches need to be taken seriously. Uh, this happens not in any particular industry. It's pretty uniform across any industry you go, right? Like here we've got uh, three examples of Life Labs, uh, Desjardins, and Anthem. In, all of, in, in many of these cases, right, like there is a unauthorized use of internal data by an employee, uh, which kind of uh, leads to a breach. Uh, now, we may try everything that we can to protect data, uh, and we do, right? Uh, data itself is our biggest asset at this point. Uh, but what's happening is there is this uh, large push by organizations to you know, move to the cloud or even secure data, but in many cases, what's happening is the employees itself of the company, uh, whether that's not the network admin or people with more access, uh, have access to the data, and these cause breaches, which cost uh, you know a lot of money. But even beyond that, the biggest cost is the trust that we lose from our customers. Right, uh, customers trust us as organizations to manage their data and maintain their data. Uh, next slide, please. And it, before we really get into it, it's it's important to understand, like you know, how does your app run uh, in the cloud? And we have this uh, term called a TCB or the Trusted Computing Base. How much do you trust in your app? In this case, when your app is running in the cloud uh, or or even locally uh, in a virtualized environment, uh, your app uh, is running along with other apps on the same operating system. Uh, it's running on hypervisors. It's running on a CPU. But at the same time, your app is exposed uh, to uh, uh, all of these attack vectors, right? So a malicious uh, actor uh, can uh, potentially do memory scraping or uh, install something on the guest OS uh, that uh, 
doesn't really protect your data as it is being used. So there, there are instances where your data is being compromised while your app is uh, just using the data, right? And at that time, um, you as an app developer did everything possible, did went through all of the uh, uh, security guidelines, did your threat models, did everything, but your app in, in, in when it's running is running in an environment where it's exposed to a bunch of attack vectors that you really can't do anything about because your boundary sort of ends at the app, right? You, you are running around. You're running on an environment where a large portion of that environment is sort of untrusted in, in many ways. Next slide, please. This is where uh, I think it's important to step back and uh, talk about what we mean by confidential computing. Uh, this definition is something that uh, has been ratified by the Confidential Computing Consortium, uh, which basically says, and I'm going to say, say it word for word, that we're talking about the protection of data in use by performing computation in a hardware-based trusted execution environment, or a TEE. So when we talk about uh, uh, protecting data in this case, we are taking a hardware-based approach uh, in a trusted execution environment to protect the data so that uh, your data is not exposed uh, uh, to the other vectors that we talked about. Next slide, please. So as we are uh, talking about confidential computing, it is also important to step back and look at the data protection lifecycle. Uh, today, when we talk about data, the data at rest is something that we've been doing forever, right? We encrypt inactive data when it's stored in the blog, uh, uh, on disk uh, or in our databases or in blobs, we do everything we can to protect that data at rest. Similarly, we protect data in transit, right? Uh, when data is moving between uh, uh, devices or across the network, it is encrypted to prevent snooping on that data as it's flowing through. And this is the problem that we are now bringing uh, as a solution, uh, which is protecting data at use, where we are protecting or encrypting data in RAM while we are doing uh, computation. So what this tells us is with, with confidential computing, we are now uh, protecting, we are completing the data uh, protection lifecycle. And what we are uh, enabling with this capability is we are evolving uh, computing in the clear, to computing confidentially. Uh, and when we talk about the cloud, we think about the cloud now moving to a confidential cloud where your data, when it's uh, running in an environment in the cloud, is protected across all three vectors, whether it's at rest, in transit, or in use. And confidential computing provides that third leg of the stool to protect that data when it is being in use. Next, please. As an app developer, uh, today, uh, you trust your app itself, right? Uh, the app that you are building, you own your app, you build your own software, you're uh, using open source components, but you trust your app code. You do everything you can as a developer to make sure that your app is hardened from a perspective that the security is as strong as you can make it. What we are enabling with confidential computing is we are reducing the need for trust for the infrastructure provider. That means that uh, we are redu reducing the need, need for trust for the uh, host admin or the VM admin, the host OS kernel, the hypervisor, or even your own network administrator, right? Your, your own network administrator who has privileged access to your VMs because they need to manage them. We are taking them out of the trust equation with confidential computing, where even if this person uh, has physical hardware access or has the ability to install something on the guest OS that your app is running on, your data and the compute that's happened on that data, whether that's model operating on a, uh, whether that's an ML model operating on that data, that, uh, aspect is completely protected uh, from the infrastructure provider in a sense. So what you're trusting in that sense is your app code and the hardware vendor, and that's it. And you're cutting the infrastructure provider completely out of your uh, TCB. Next slide, please. So how does that actually happen? In this example, uh, what we're talking about is we, we are enabling confidential computing today on Intel SGX hardware, secure guard extensions. Uh, that's what SGX stands for. 
So the previous picture showed your app running on uh, the guest OS or the host OS or the hypervisor. But with confidential computing, uh, your app essentially creates a process on the side where your code and data is protected uh, when it is uh, being operated upon. And only the, uh, the, the entity that owns the key to that data has access to the data. So Intel SGX is the, uh, the current means that we are using in the cloud, to, or, or even on-prem for that matter, to protect data where it's in use. And Intel SGX brings this new hardware architecture. These are new instruction sets uh, that have been provided that allows you to carve out a piece of uh, your memory as a so your your there are new instruction sets provided that set us out aside this private uh, uh, memory region that it can only be accessed with the entity that owns the key and the important part is the third bullet point on that screen which is data is only ever in the clear within that protected memory and it's encrypted every time it is pushed out of the CPU. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been doing this, uh, you know, out in the open with a consortium of folks uh, uh, to really make this an entire industry-driven effort. Uh, uh, there are a bunch of organizations that have come together, created the Confidential Computing Consortium. Uh, we encourage you to uh, join and visit the website and uh, take a look at everything that's happening in that space. Uh, this consortium was formed in September 2019, and uh, in a short period of time, we've gotten uh, membership across a wide range of companies uh, that are participating in the consortium. And we, together, we are building this confidential computing industry together to protect that data in the clear. Our vision is that we foresee that uh, computing data in the clear is going to be a thing of the past. Uh, we are going to be moving to a world where confu uh, computing confidentially will essentially be the norm, the same way HTTP evolved to HTTPS. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a good time now to talk about a few use cases. Where would you use confidential computing? And a lot of this is honestly uh, driven through what we are seeing in the industry across all of our partners and our customers. Uh, these are uh, uh, four high-level uh, categories of uh, use cases that we've seen. Uh, but if you go back to the previous statement that I made, that you know we see computing in the clear evolve to computing confidentially. So eventually, we we do expect you know that uh, confidential computing will become the norm. But right now, like these are the four use cases uh, that we've kind of highlighted as ones that we are seeing a ton of interest from our customers and partners. So clearly the first one is secret storage and processing, right? Like when you're storing your keys, you want to make sure that they are stored in a place where, you know, they are completely secure, right? So you want to make sure that they are stored. And when, when, when you're operating on those keys, your keys need to be uh, secure in that secure enclave. The other use case that we are see, uh, uh, seeing a ton of interest on is confidential analytics, where today in the world that we're living in, like ML model, the model itself, is the asset, is the IP that we want to protect. So uh, what we're seeing is that uh, customers want to protect their ML uh, code and data uh, as it's being operated upon. And uh, one of the clearly, you know, single party use cases where a company or an organization wants to make sure that uh, its uh, data and code is protected are, are many of the use cases. But uh, there is a, a use case that we've seen uh, bubble up uh, Pretty uh, uh, pretty widely, uh, we have a few pilots underway uh, across across financial uh, services and across uh, healthcare. So I'm kind of giving you my experience here, which is around multi-party data sharing, where multiple parties need to share data with each other to solve a business problem while still maintaining confidentiality. And I've got a couple of slides after this. And another use case that is also uh, becoming very popular is this edge IoT sort of play, right? Uh, we've been talking about it as an intelligent edge, intelligent cloud story. Uh, the, the piece that we are really resonating, that, that we see resonating with uh, uh, developers is uh, they want to be able to protect data, not just in the cloud or on-prem for that matter when it's uh, operating, but also when it's operating at the edge. Um, and that entire end-to-end -end 
uh, view where my data, whenever it's being operated upon, is protected at the edge or the cloud at the same time. Next slide, please. So I've got two use cases that I'm going to talk about uh, to kind of just spark your uh, imagination here, and both of them are around the uh, multi-party data sharing uh, use cases. So in this case, uh, what we want to solve is for fraud detection. Uh, you know, fraud detection uh, in in banks and financial institutions is clearly one of those uh, uh, important areas that uh, companies are trying to solve, uh, but when you're when you're trying to look for fraud and the only data you have is your data you don't have a complete view of data as it's moving across different organizations so multiple banks for example may want to come together and pool their data in in one common uh, enclave and operate on that data to find those patterns and analytics either with you know plain old rule based analytics or run machine learning models uh, on that uh, on that data but what confidential computing allows you, it allows you to run those agreed upon analytics on this combined sensitive data set where bank five doesn't have access to the data on bank one. The only entity that has access to the data is that code that's operating on the data. So data is only ever in the clear when it's operating inside the enclave. So what you get out of this are those outcomes which are you know, increased detection rates across not just your data set, across a wide variety of data sets. You want to reduce false positives here, right? And you want to do iterative learnings where this, this essentially becomes a, a way of operating where you're constantly getting that feedback uh, throughout uh, your life cycle where multiple banks are sort of collaborating together in a way that none of them are giving away their sensitive IP, but still getting that business result that they're looking for, which is to solve fraud detection. Next slide, please. Here's another use case that we are seeing in healthcare. Uh, you know, stepping back, right? Uh, drug development uh, is is a complex task, uh, and when you have only your data as a drug company, uh, you you don't have the full data set, right? Like there's only limited uh, benefit that you can get from uh, this. But uh, we've seen uh, uh, multiple drug companies wanting to pool their data together and get that global good whether that's you know, with time series trials or clinical trials, where a, a machine learning algorithm is operating on that common patient data set across multiple providers, where each facility only sees their respective data sets and nobody, not even the cloud provider, can see all the data or that model if necessary. And the benefit of this is all facilities benefit from using that one common trained model on a common data set that still maintains that confidentiality. Next slide, please. So I think at this set, my time is up and I'm gonna hand the uh, ball over to Nihal. To keep the show going, I'm happy to take the slides forward uh, okay. if you'd like. Uh, and Nihal, please speak up if you, if, if you, if you do get volume uh, and I'll try to pretend to be the best Nihal I can. Uh, so I'm going to next talk about uh, developing apps for confidential computing, right? Uh, so as we kind of look at the entire uh, platform tools and ecosystem in this space, uh, you know, confidential computing is something that has been uh, happening for a while. Uh, this is, you know, it, this is as I mentioned earlier, it's a TEE, it's a trusted execution environment that's based out of hardware. So clearly, we need that ability in the CPU. Uh, which allows us to create that encrypted uh, memory that uh, is that protects our data and our code. This is something that has been available in the Intel core processors, uh, Skylake and KB Lake. Uh, we've got the uh, Coffee Lake uh, 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 processors in in the Azure cloud right now. If you want to go uh, try it out, IBM has a bare metal cloud offering. Uh, Alibaba has a bare metal uh, offering as well. Uh, hey, because uh, can you expand the slides? Like, basically, can you do it in presentation mode? Yes, I can. Great. So, uh, I was talking about the cloud capabilities available right now. Uh, so, you know, the, the the capability for this are 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 starting to get expanded in the cloud. Uh, as I mentioned, IBM and Alibaba give you those bare metal instances, and with Azure, you get those virtualized instances in the cloud. Uh, 
um, we have support for both Linux and uh, Windows in the cloud. But the picture on the right is clearly the, is, is the one that is uh, really interesting because you can see there's an ecosystem being formed here, right? And just like any good ecosystem that you want to build, uh, I'm a I'm a developer guy at the heart. I started at Microsoft in DevDev, dev, right? I used to own the C++ compiler. And I know that to have a, uh, a rich ecosystem around you is critical to bring any new technology forward. Uh, in the CCC today, the Confidential Computing Consortium, we have the NRX uh, SDK, the Open Enclave SDK, and the Intel SGX SDK from Linux already there. Uh, members have other SDKs that they are providing, for example, Google as a silo. Uh, even in the larger ecosystem, we've got higher level uh, capabilities from, say, Graphene, uh, which, is, which allows you to take your existing application and run it unmodified in the cloud. Moving forward. So uh, I, have, I mentioned this before in the earlier uh, talk track. Hey everyone, sorry, I, I I had a very big disconnect. I'm I apologize. I don't know what happened with the with my internet setting. Can you guys hear me now? Uh, we, can, we can we can hear you. So Nihal, I'm gonna go mute, and why don't you take over the slides, and I can be a slide monkey. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And I apologize again. There was some internet outage in this, and like I I got lost. I just got back in. So, uh, so just coming back on like you know the HEX discussion that uh, this is more like you know developer development based section on like you know the discussion we had on confidential computing. Uh, the the tool chain that we discussed like you know uh, can you can you go back a slide uh, uh, so that we can we can talk about ecosystem a little bit yeah this one please. Uh, so so there are, there uh, as. as Nihal, I already covered the slide, but you can go through it again if you'd like. Perfect. All right. So yeah, uh, what I was gonna say that you know uh, the, there are like you know, all all the, there are various all the members in the community have like a lot of development uh, tool chain options, and uh, of course Intel uh, being like you know the main leader here on uh, the SCX technology, they're providing they're providing the core oh, the core like you know development SDK Microsoft. Microsoft has uh, Open Enclave SDK that's available for Windows and Linux, and Photonics has an Enclave development platform that's a Rust-based secure environment. And we're gonna dig deeper into like you know uh, how this works uh, with uh, uh, with practice, like you know <clears throat> how the architecture of the uh, system is, and how you can like you know write your own applications using some of these tools. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, so I mean, we we discuss all the good, you know, good things that uh, that we talked about the use cases. Now let's talk about how this is possible, like how this works internally, uh, and and how this Intel ex execution actually works in practice. Uh, uh, what are what are the basic system primitives, and how how I mean how this whole things works together. Uh, so so the SGX uh, has this notion of enclaves. Uh, Enclave is a, uh, you know it's an encrypted memory area that's that's integrity protected and uh, of course like you know uh, uh, secured and protected from like you know untrusted code and platform. Uh, think think of an enclave as you know as as a as an encrypted channel between the C CPU and and RAM uh, that's directly getting encrypted by a key inside the CPU and uh, and the the way this this works in practice. Like you know, application writer writes an enclave, signs signs an enclave, and uh, the, the 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 verification inside the CPU basically uh, verifies that encl enclave has not been tampered with, loads inside an encrypted memory area, and begins the execution. And 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 this this is how you basically you reduce the TCB that we talked about earlier. Uh, to a very small uh, TCB, uh, so so the only component in TCB with uh, with enclave based execution is the enclave itself, and and the CPU chipset. And I have more details on this, like you know, on on the on the practice. And we're definitely going to do a demo and see how this works in practice, so that it it it's more than like theory at that point. Uh, any any questions here before before I like you know move on to the next slide? I have a question regarding uh, the 
availability of this uh, solution. Um, I remember Intel was at RSA. I'm going to cover that. Okay. Okay. I'm going to cover that in one of my slides. So, so definitely, that's that's a great question. Uh, also, uh, I have a question. So, from the hardware perspective, I understand that you want to do a partition. It's essentially an encrypted memory within the CPU. But in case of a shared environment where there are multiple applications running on the same ecosystem, uh, and if multiple applications would like to take advantage of this hardware fees, how is it differentiated between between applications, possibly between different organizations running applications on same ecosystem? Perfect. That's a great so that's a great segue to my next slide. This is also a great question. So I'm gonna cover that. How this actually works in practice. Uh, can you can you go to the next next slide now, Vikas, please? Perfect. Okay. So, so to so, so this ans uh, to answer the question that's been asked uh, last, like you know, how how is this possible that you know different organization uh, or different application writers make sure that you know the other application writers or or, or it's is like you know it's it's getting a share in in a different different memory space or how are they protecting their environment against. Uh, against other other uh, applications running on the same system so so the idea here is basically uh, i mean uh, everybody gets the piece of uh, encrypted memory section called epc and when an application launches uh, that basically uh, at the launch time it asks for an enclave page cache uh, or enclave page sizes and that's that's get that's basically partitioned out from a uh, large physical memory so, uh, so on a higher level, like you know, uh, the the trust mechanism how this works is like you know, a CPU package as a key, and then a memory encryption engine that's running inside the package. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> it's basically encrypting and decrypting uh, read and write to the memory area that's happening on the physical memory uh, for for the on page cache. Uh, that's the encrypted area for reserved for for enclave based computing and uh, as the applications come and write you know brings their enclaves uh, they get you know, a piece of the page cache and every every, you know, every application uh, that's like you know running an enclave gets a separate enclave area so it's so it's reserved for that application uh, from like you know ad address space of the application uh, up to down to the cpu uh, the whole area has been encrypted. There's no snooping possible, uh, so no sharing possible within the address space of the enclave. So, so that's like you know the broader uh, answer to the question of like you know how are applications basically uh, you know, sharing this and how it's it's protecting its its own address space against like you know other others other applications running uh, along with like you know the privileged system software running on on the system. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I guess you were asking that yes. question, right? Yes. Yes. This is good. Thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, right. So that that's how it happens, like you know, in in a, in, a, in, a, in a practical sense. Uh, let's let's keep uh, moving because we have uh, go to the next slide. So this ecosystem is ecosystem provides uh, an environment where uh, where you can. <clears throat> Where you, can, where you can not only like you know protect your application secret on a on a remote system, you can also remotely verify that, that the, the the enclave that you created uh, on a remote environment is basically the same enclave that you created. Uh, it's uh, it's it has like you know the integrity protection uh, as part of like you know the, how the enclave runs, and you can also verify like you know the hardware uh, is is genuine real SGX CPU. Uh, which Intel you know, verifies the integrity of the enclave and confidentiality. Uh, but uh, the bigger piece here is like, you know, from a remote system, you can verify that that the cloud provider or the cloud-based uh, system they're using for running your application is is basically a genuine a genuine hardware, and it's going to give you all the guarantees that we just just promised for with using this technology. And the, the process is it's it's pretty I mean it's 
it's a little bit a little bit involved, but all the all the libraries and the the platform that uh, that we show uh, showed in the ecosystem slide. Each one of the development platform has like you know built some kind of a test station uh, uh, mechanism and. Commercial products out there verify uh, which makes uh, which makes like you know this attestation uh, uh, process pretty simple. For example, Photonics has a product called uh, uh, Enclave Manager that lets lets you wrap this uh, remote verification inside you know uh, inside uh, a simple certificate based chain. And there are, I'm I'm sure there will be like you know more more of this uh, happen, happening as we go mainstream with uh, with conversational compute. Uh, the report, remote attestation becomes like you know critical piece. All right. Uh, next slide, please, Vikas. If, if there are questions here, I can take more questions uh, uh, on the remote attestation. Okay, perfect. So, uh, what are the challenges? Uh, I, I think there was a question here on availability. Uh, I, I want to address that. Like, you know, the availability piece was uh, the availability of uh, so all all Intel Core CPUs. Uh, Intel Core is I uh, like you know I I series CPUs I three I five uh, I seven. They have SGX inbuilt. Uh, also, uh, like you know, if you if you go by a CPU architecture name um, uh, from Skylake onwards, that that is a CPU architecture that came in 2015. Uh, all all the following architecture have Intel SGX, I, uh, uh, Skylake, Kobe Lake, and the next generation, like you know, Ice Lake, whenever it's coming, has has Intel SGX uh, as as part of the core technology. Uh, I think we we missed uh, uh, application programming slide. So, so the challenge is uh, uh, we can we can go back to the application programming side, and I can do a, a demo on seventeen uh, on seventeen uh, because uh, there is an application programming model on seventeen that uh, we wanted to talk about in general. Uh, so, how how do you create these enclaves? Uh, uh, the the enclave uh, creation requires like you know uh, careful. Uh, uh, I mean, the model is basically you create an enclave uh, using one of the tools, and that we mentioned earlier, right? Uh, using uh, using some of the uh, some of the uh, platform tools that are available from Intel, Microsoft, or Tanix, uh, that lets you create enclaves. And uh, and and in order to incorporate your app, uh, your your application with with this enclave uh, computing. Uh, you have to you have to basically uh, partition your application into an enclave and non enclave world. Uh, so, so so that that is a kind of a requirement of like you know uh, to understand the the programming model. Like the enclave doesn't have access to the system resources. Uh, like you know within an enclave we cannot make system calls. So you you have to like you know partition your application where your enclave piece is uh, a trusted piece where it it loads it does a computation protects your secret uh, has some piece of uh, uh, like you know uh, some uh, some piece that you want to protect it can be a model machine learning model that's running in an enclave you want to protect that uh, <coughs> but your application uh, basically needs to needs to take care of. Uh, Partitioning it into like you know creating an enclave, jumping in, jumping inside the enclave, doing the secret computation, and coming out of the enclave uh, computation uh, environment. So that's that's basically the programming model, and all the development platform uh, uh, have have different uh, uh, different ways to do this. There are some environments and development platform where uh, where this application partitioning is not required. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, Photonix has a product called Enclave, where, which lets you run applications unmodified. Uh, there are other uh, similar environments. There's one called Scone, uh, and there is an open source project. Uh, uh, there are a couple of actually uh, open source projects that that lets you run or unmodified applications uh, uh, inside inside uh, SGX technology. Any questions here? Okay, perfect. So let's let's move forward. And it, I think now we can talk about like you know 
uh, challenges a little bit on slide 19 and I'm gonna, then I'm going to jump into a, a demo. Uh, it, uh, just one more. Yes. All right. So what are the, what are the challenges uh, uh, of this technology? Uh, some of that we always seen like, you know, uh, that the application programming needs to change. Like, you know, you have to partition your application. So legally, legacy application support is, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a pain and, and a lot of, you know, some of the vendors are trying to solve that problem uh, using like, you know, an application wrapping layer, as we talked about. Uh, and the other challenges are like, you know, limited memory with the current versions. Uh, the EPC cache size for for Enclaves right now is limited. Uh, so you have to basically take care of that as, as part of your programming model that that you have like, you know, small, small amount of active RAM in your application. And that Otherwise, like you know, the the, the paging effect of uh, in and out of Enclave coming in and out of Enclave can be like you know uh, performance uh, intensive. And there are there are some like you know it's, uh, this is not a panacea for everything. Intel SGX is like you know if you if your application is still is not partitioned correctly and is leaking secrets to a non non secure world, then it's it's not obviously going to protect against that. So it still requires uh, careful programming. Uh, I think some of that can be taken care of by using a uh, right uh, development platform. Uh, like, you know, for example, Rust. Rust is a good programming language for writing your enclaves in. And using a, a Rust-based development platform can reduce some of the some of the uh, issues uh, where your application, like, you know, is vulnerable to a uh, certain kind of, like, you know, memory corruption or other issues. And uh, there's there have been uh, there have been recent uh, recently, there have been a lot of activity on side channels, and uh, and there 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 are a lot of them like you know uh, in recent uh, past that came out, which which I consider personally is a good sign as a validation for this technology that you know it's speaking it's speaking steam in like not only in uh, not only in the research institutions it's also be, uh, being mainstream in institute you know in large institutions uh, you know Azure is a prime example of that. Uh, so, so I, I assume, like you know, this is a good sign that the the the, the memory, the sidechain attacks, which rely on like you know, speculative execution, uh, for example, Spectre meltdown and the recent LBI attack, they're exposing some of some of the limitations of this technology, and they're being patched like you know uh, as uh, very actively. The whole community around this is very active, and they're coming up with fixes uh, faster and sooner. Uh, I mean, as 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 they're published, so I I do see that as a positive uh, positive of like you know the uh, positive sign, but I mean, there there is something to be considered when you're developing your application in this environment. Okay. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Vikas. If there are no questions here. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we talked about this a little bit. Uh, we uh, for times we build a whole, uh, you know, application suit. We call it runtime encryption that uses SGX as a base technology. The key management uh, uh, product uh, also like an Enclave OS and uh, Enclave development platform that lets you write applications. Uh, that lets you write applications to this environment. And. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to demo it like you know a particular application as a next uh, next step. Uh, so so that uh, we see that this is like you know it's not all theory. It's in practice. It's in practice. How easy is it? Uh, and like you know how these attacks can be carried out pretty simply uh, on 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 your systems. Uh, next slide, please, because. Okay, demo time. Uh, so. <clears throat> So I'm going to uh, show a small app that uh, that's basically uh, a, a Python app, and uh, I'm going to show how easy is it uh, to run like you know uh, attack like this, and how e uh, how to protect uh, protect uh, protect against an attack like. Uh, uh, let me open a terminal on. Uh,
I'm, ru I'm running this all uh, on Azure VM. Uh, so you can e easily get like an Azure VM, right? Uh, uh, it's available in Azure Marketplace. Okay. All right, perfect. Uh, It's, it's as I said, it's a simple demo, uh, it's, but we have some of the demos uh, like you know available for you to look out as part of the slide that gets distributed. Uh, so let me open open a, an application that that I was talking about. Uh, so this is a simple Python server. Uh, this Python server has, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure people have played with fast Flask application in Python. This is a simple Flask based server that has a secret. Uh, and the secret is like, you know, in this case is an SSH key. And uh, we're gonna run the server uh, in, on, on, the, <coughs> on the system. And I'm gonna show you how easy is it to get this key out uh, using an existing tool, tool chain uh, from, uh, from like, you know, the standard Linux environment. So let me first run that application. So, so this is the server running. <laughs> right. Let me know if you guys cannot see my screen and I can, uh, can scroll down or make it bigger. So this is a standard uh, process. I'm just gonna basically dump, uh, dump, dump the memory of the, pro of the process that's running with the secret uh, with the standard uh, Linux tool. It's called G-Core. It comes with uh, like you know uh, GDB, uh, and that was the process. We know that too. For this is the process that we just started. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, dump the memory file and. And just, just to make sure that okay. So, so what I did right now, I'm gonna repeat what I did so that we understand. Like, you know, I, I ran a process. There was uh, there was a Python program. That program has a secret, and you it can be like, you know, you, if you are deploying this kind of application on cloud, that has a secret. How easy is it, like, you know, for somebody who is having a admin access to run like, you know, a couple of command Linux command, to to basically uh, like, you know dump the process memory and uh, and get get a secret rather uh, you know for example a key or anything like that uh very easily like you know from from the from the system and uh, I, I can run the same application uh in an in secure sgx environment and if i run the uh, run the application in a secure uh, and you basically grab grab the memory from an SCX based application. Uh, you are not gonna definitely get uh, uh, get the secret out. And also, a memory dump from like you know SCX based environment is all encrypted. You can verify uh, using using pretty like you know standard uh, tools out there. So, so that that's what a simple demonstration I wanted to like you know do, and uh, I know we, I have only two minutes of time, uh, and I, I wanted to open up for uh, for questions uh, for like you know last few minutes. There there are four or five demo as part of the slides that uh, that we have uh, that's gonna get shared. You can watch this demonstration uh, uh, by just clicking on the links. Uh, we have we we have demonstration on how easy is it to do it like you know on. Uh, on a database uh, or or a, or an application server like you know nginx web server all of this is possible by a few simple commands and if you run these application in a secure enclave environment uh, uh, all of these attacks uh, can be can be uh, like you know uh, stopped 
And that that this basic simple functionality like you know leads away to larger use cases as we talked about earlier, like you know as Vikas pointed out that uh, like you know secure multi-party computation and uh, like you know drug drug discovery on confidential data, all of this is possible uh, because uh, this this technology can can prevent uh, like you know access to the memory area and other other uh, you know. Uh, other critical pieces of like you know <clears throat> application like you know log application logic itself is protected so people can build on top of uh, this basic technology some of the very interesting use cases we are seeing in confidential computing landscape uh, i'm running out of time this is 7:15 so i'm going to pause here and uh, you know wait for questions or uh, or uh, hope uh, or basically follow instruction from oz because he has to keep the time. I just had a small, quick question. Uh, so, in this encryption, uh, what are kind of what kind of mechanism or what kind of encryption is generally used? What are some of the examples? How is it encrypted? That's that's a great question. So, so the native encryption for SGX is AES and I uh, uh, that 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 uh, two fifty six bit AES encryption. I guess that's that's the native. Uh, Mm, uh, encryption for memory, and when once you're inside an enclave, uh, then you can use any existing encryption library that that you can write. You know your own protocol, create keys. Uh, all of that is possible within within once you are inside inside an enclave, and and the SGX provides some basic functionality like you know uh, key creation, sealing, all of that uh, uh, as part of the like you know the develop, development framework. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Any any other questions? Worries. Thanks, Vishali. Any any other questions uh, for uh, uh, before I hand it over to Oz back? Hey, one more quick question. What about applications with multi-tier architectures that are that may not be written in C or Rust that you want each layer of the architecture to be able to encrypt sensitive data as it's passed. How do you guys typically handle that? That's that's a great question. Yeah. So for that, we we come across that use case all the time. Uh, what we recommend is like you know you run you run all the applications like you know whether it's a Kubernetes based deployment, Docker based deployment. You run all of them application uh, basically inside enclaves, and you have like you know, you use uh, secure TLS communication or uh, between those applications, uh, and between enclave to enclave. So, for example, let's say a standard uh, three-tier application that is like you know nginx and web web application and a, and a database, right? We recommend that you know you run all the applications inside enclave and uh, create TLS connections between between those enclaves to to deploy like you know multi-tier application. Thank Does it answer your question, Jimmy, on a high level? Yeah, I, I think so. Really, what I'm curious about is um, if you say pass a secret uh, between applications, how do you protect that secret? And and I think the answer is you run them all in an app in an enclave and use remote attestation between enclaves in order to to pass that secret. That's, that's correct. And and we have a product. Uh, we have a secret management product that natively understand SGX attestation. So uh, you know, that's that's going to come eventually. Like you know, and and more more products where where your key manager or secret manager can natively verify SGX attestation, and and provision secrets and TLS keys in applications. Thank you. There was a question on. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Shiva. Yeah. So yeah. So. What is the additional um, overhead from budget's perspective, right? You know, today, you know, the enterprise clouds that thrive on competitive pricing, right? Now, adding an additional layer of infrastructure level security, so that obviously is going to be, I'm assuming, a deal breaker for some of the lower tier organizations. I understand for banks and hospitals, probably they can pull it, pull it off. So I'm curious, you know, what is the pricing uh, variation with uh, with our general uh, general security works versus infrastructure? 
So I can take that one. Uh, uh, ahead, from a, yeah, thanks. Uh, from a cloud provider perspective, I think it really depends on the provider. I'm not that familiar with the pricing that uh, Alibaba and I provides, but at least from a Microsoft perspective, we've tried to keep it, you know, the same or maybe a slight premium, uh, if you may. Uh, this is not something that you know we see as being a a, um, a capability that uh, you know we want to democratize this capability essentially, right? Like we know that. Uh, applications need uh, to protect the data in the clear. Like we just expect that this is going to be ubiquitous. Uh, you know, at some point, um, the price premium on this is not something that uh, is a huge focus at this point. It's more on getting uh, adoption, usage, awareness, and feedback from communities such as this. Uh, these are uh, early days, uh, but at the same time, we are seeing customers. Who are taking uh, real life production workloads, uh, real life workloads to production with this sort of capability across a wide variety? To be honest, I've seen, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, clearly I've seen a bunch of uh, you know uh, financial, healthcare, uh, government use cases. Uh, that's where we do see this being a sweet spot in the regulated industries. But at the same time, I have been talking to. A bunch of customers who are using this sort of in 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 areas like blockchain, um, right? Where you you this this sort of technology enables you to build consensus way faster. So it does apply to a wide variety of industries. I'll, I'll pause there. Sure. Thank I you. See. Thank you, Vikas. You're welcome. Hey, Hello. I have a quick question on the performance aspect uh, of the application because now we have this layer of uh, Enclave and um, how is that uh, impacting, you know, because uh, existing applications need, need to be rewritten. If there, is there any like a performance, uh, big difference happening prior to using SG, uh, Enclave versus post Enclave? Yeah, that that's a, also a great question. So uh, the, 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 I mean, the cookie cutter answer I can give you is it all depends, but let me do dive, let me give you a little more detail on this. So the way application model that was like you know, designed for SGX was uh, basically you you have you have some secret that you want to protect, and as long as your your application memory it's like you know it's uh, it's proportional like you know active memory of your application is proportional to the enclave page cache on the server, and you are doing like you know, a lot of compute compute based application. Uh, then it can be up to native performance. We measure that for a lot of, like, you know, for example, a CPU benchmark we ran, it it was native. And then if your application is doing a lot of IO switching between, like, you know, uh, enclave to non-enclave world and uh, and uh, also, like, you know, being uh, being doing a lot of network interrupts or other, you know, other kind of switching, then it can, it can be high. Uh, so it, it basically depends on how you design your application, and some of the some of the latest tools have been become really good at at this. So uh, so there's 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 no definite answer, but uh, it can be it can be like you know optimized for this environment. Does does this answer your question on the broad? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Hey, it's Jamie. One last question. Do you see any? any standards based approaches at this point when it comes to a compliance standard maybe considering this i know adoption is probably way too early for them to take it on but do you see any interest um from compliance organizations such as pci in considering this uh, I, I i can take a short stab and i i think i, I will let uh because also heck a step. I, we do see a lot of financial organizations they are they're coming and asking this question and it's going to get a standardized uh, and there are some there are, I mean, for for example our product that that uh, we do a, a secure key management product that uses sgx internally and we have a fips level 3 compliance box uh, built on top of this technology so this this technology itself uh, doesn't like you know pre like prevent uh, any kind of um, uh, some some of the certification uh, it has to be additional on top Thanks, Nihal. Uh, add plus one to what Nihal said. Um, we we do see uh, compliance being a a central tenant. In fact, I'm about to get into 
uh, that world with a with a with a customer uh, next week, um, and it, it is a financial uh, uh, industry customer. And what we are seeing is uh, a compliance organizations inside uh, compliance uh, uh, businesses inside these organizations are taking a deeper look at this, and they are going into a bunch of depth. The FIPS level certifications that Nihal mentioned uh, are pretty uh, are questions that people are asking for, and um, ISVs in this space are uh, uh, providing uh, uh, innovations that kind of answer those sort of questions. But I do expect uh, at least in at least a couple of production workloads that I've seen, uh, compliance is a factor. But over time, I do expect to see it a lot of focus on this uh, but one thing is important that this is a layer that does add on top that you need to think through as you're building this for you know multi-tier uh, thousands of nodes sort of applications uh, over time that do handle sensitive data in this case so if i were to summarize that would i be correct in saying that this is now being looked at in terms of fits compliance but outside of that it's more organizational internal policy and not necessarily uh, a contractual bind or a a legal bind such as HIPAA versus NPCI? Um, it depends, and honestly, it is it is a mix of both. Like, from a from a, from a, uh, um, a regulators asking for this, I have not uh, quite seen that uh, just yet. Uh, but organizations are taking a uh, an active role in ensuring compliance in uh, applications that use this sort of technology. So I'm sorry, this is a sort of a soft answer, uh, but I, but I understand. No, it. no, no, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, just before continue, uh, we have a couple more questions in the chat window. First question was from Gopi: Is this hardware available now on in the market? And Vikas answered that question. Uh, would you like to repeat? Because your question, your answer. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll quickly go through the questions and answers and, and I'll be cognizant of time. Thanks for bringing that up. Oz. Uh, yeah, the, the Gopi asked this question. Is this hardware available now in the market? Uh, yes, uh, it, you know, you can buy the Intel uh, uh, Coffee Lake Plus plus uh, chips and run them on prem. Nothing stops you from doing that uh, from a cloud perspective. At this moment, we are aware of uh, you know three cloud providers that provide this. Uh, Alibaba and IBM uh, provide bare metal services, and Azure provides a virtualized environment. Uh, that was the first question. Just to just to add just to add that to the question, because I I think if you're using a virtualized environment like like Azure, you don't have to worry about hardware, but but it, the hardware is available in like you know different uh, like for example, E three servers are available in market uh, and it, it i think all the on the all the core cpus from intel like you know from i i3 onwards have sgx for desktop machines sorry because go ahead i i, I didn't mean to interrupt i just wanted to add, add to that. Oh, thanks for the clarification i was just going to quickly run through the last two questions on this uh keeping keeping uh, an eye on the clock uh, the, the the question from NEO, which was uh, why is SGX not available with the Google Cloud platform? I don't know. <laughs> it's a question for folks in Google. Uh, Google needs to catch up. That's my answer. Uh, you know, being for Microsoft, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can say that because I'm I'm like you know, I'm, 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 so Google, Google. I I hope it's gonna come up in all cloud providers. But I, what I like, what you can answer right now is I guess Microsoft is leading it right now. Uh, there is a there is, however, uh, you know, uh, we do, as I mentioned, at least three times in this call, uh, like this is something that we do expect, you know, uh, from a uh, uh, hardware perspective to be ubiquitous. Uh, you know, ARM provides this uh, for Trust Zone, Intel provides this for SGX. Uh, we do see this to be uh, more widely available. And there was another question uh, from Ruiri. Sorry if I ruined your name. Pronunciation: Is there any rumor for when SGX2 with unlimited enclave page cache will come out? Again, like you know, I don't think I can access. I do know, but I I can't uh, answer rumors. Uh, I I think to, to, soon would, is the right answer, Vikas. Sorry, soon is the right answer. Soon, soon is definitely a, a good answer that I would go with. Uh, it is something that we are actively working on. Yeah, I'm going to continue looking at the questions from Sachin. Uh, does SGA works with uh, non-Intel processors like AMD ARM? 
Well, SGX is an Intel technology arm has their own trust zone offering, uh, uh, you know, capability. Uh, SDKs provide support for that. The OE SDK, Open Enclave SDK provides support for uh, SGX and, and ARM as an example. Other SDKs also do provide that support. And we are at time. So this last question I will not address, but I'll try to answer in the chat window. Uh, my uh, Twitter handle and Nehal's Twitter handle is on the slide deck. So feel free to yeah, uh, contact yeah. us offline as well. Uh, and I'll pause over here. Thank you everyone for your time. And uh, Thank stay safe, yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, stay safe. There are some links in the demos and for uh, like a reference material on the slide that Oz is going to share. So, and you can feel free to reach out, reach us out on the Twitter handle uh, that uh, Vikas mentioned. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you so much, Nihal and Vikas, uh, for for great talk. Uh, it's been very informative for all of us, I believe.